live from AARP. Embrace your health, beauty, and sex life during menopause with your hosts, Barbara Hanna Grupperman and Dr. Margaret Noctegall. Hello, everyone. Welcome. I'm Barbara Hanna Grupperman, author of Love Your Age and founder of Menopause Cheat Sheet, a weekly newsletter focusing on menopause. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. This is the second episode in our five-part series focusing on all aspects of menopause. And if you missed last week's episode, no problem. All you have to do is go to, um, on Facebook, the Girlfriend Facebook page, and all of the videos after each show will be there. So you can watch them over and over again, as often as you like. <laughs> A great big welcome to all AARP members, and of course, for all of you live streaming in from The Girlfriend, The Ethel, and Sisters Facebook pages, hello, hello, big welcome, and to all of you who are Zooming in as well. AARP wanted to present this series of virtual events focusing on menopause to help open up the conversation about a topic that really is still taboo, which is crazy. Uh, March is Women's History Month, and we feel that is the best time to talk about something that happens to more than half the world's population. Don't you agree? Yes, you do. <laughs> now, this coming week, we uh, next week, excuse me, next week we're going to be talking about um, sexual health and vaginal health with an incredible expert. Dr. Lori Mintz, who is a best-selling author, and she's a psychologist who focuses on sex and relationships. This is a five-part series, so every Wednesday night at 7 p.m. Eastern time, we're going to gather here and we'll welcome a different guest expert to shed some light cut out some of the confusion. We'll also have some live poll questions for you so we can get a sense of what you're thinking and where you are on your personal menopause journey. And really exciting, we also encourage you to submit your questions to us throughout each show. Now, I'm, I'm gonna tell you in a second how we're gonna do that, but just so you know, I will be looking down sometimes during the show at my phone and also my, e my iPad because I'm gonna be fielding a, all of your questions. I don't wanna miss any. We wanna get to as many as we can. So I'm not texting my husband to remind him to walk the dog during the show now. No, 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 I'm fielding your question. Just wanna let you know that. So let me tell you how we're going to do this. This is a very interactive experience for all of us. So we're gonna ask you to do two things. One, submit your questions throughout the show to our guest experts, to me, to all of us. And how you do that is you go to the chat function on Zoom right there at the bottom and also the chat function on Facebook and just put in your questions to us. Then, very fun, we're going to be asking you some poll questions because again, we want to find out where you are on your own journey and what you're thinking. So to answer those questions, go look at this video. So you get your cell phone, go to text, and then you go 22333, okay? Type in 22333, and then AARP in the message area and hit send, you'll get a response right there. Then you're all set that all you have to do is put in your answers, A, B, C, D, or in some cases, we also ask you to submit a word. Um, so just do that once and you won't have to do it again, but I will remind you throughout. So questions to us in your chat function and uh, participating in the polls, you pick up your phone and you text to us 22333 AARP and then the rest is magic. Now let's do a little uh, test, shall we, to make sure that we all know what we're doing and make sure I know what I'm doing with the poll questions. And this one's pretty easy. So get at your phones and go ahead and do two, two, three, 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 do all of that. And please submit your answers to what is your age range. A is 18 to 25, B 
is 26 to 35, C is 36 to 45, D is 45 to 65, and E is 66 and over. So now while you're putting in your answers to that poll question, I would love to introduce my co-host, who is going to be with me every Wednesday night to welcome our guest experts and shed some more light on menopause and everything having to do with menopause. Dr. Margaret Noctegal is a reproductive endocrinologist, and she's also a clinical associate professor in the division of OBGYN, Department of Reproductive Endocrinologists at NYU Langone Health in New York City. And she's been in practice for over 25 years. And I think I've known her for most of those 25 years. And I also work very closely with her because she's the medical director of Menopause Chi Chi. Dr. Margaret, welcome. Hi, Barbara. How are you? We had the best time last week, didn't we? We do, we do, yes. And we're gonna have a great time today as well. Absolutely. Um, so. We, last week, you kicked off the stove with some amazing stats, what we like to call the wow stats. So what do you have for us today? I have a couple of wow stats for us. First of all, I'm not sure if you knew that 6,000 women enter menopause every single day in the United States. That's a big number. Now, I'm fortunate enough to be able to see some of these women in my office, which is great. Last week, we talked about perimenopause and the road to menopause. Today, tonight, we're going to talk about menopause. Remember that menopause is the time after an entire year has passed since the last period. In the United States, the average age of menopause is 51. Of course, there's a range. Um, and in worldwide, by the year 2025, 1.1 billion women will be postmenopausal. That's a quite an impressive number, Dr. Margaret. <laughs> quite the impressive really number. 1.1 billion women. 1.1 billion. I'm postmenopausal. I'm part of that group. But, you know, very often postmenopausal women's needs, their special needs aren't really met. And there's a lot of confusion and a lot of myths running around out there. One of the biggest myths I've heard is that, okay, so once you go through perimenopause, you have all of those symptoms and then you hit menopause and you're postmenopausal, those symptoms go away. But that's not necessarily true for a lot of women, right, Dr. It's, Margaret? It, that's exactly right, Barbara. Those symptoms, I mean, some of them do get better as menopause ensues, but many of them, in fact, most of them get worse without treatment. And you just saw the word cloud that we formed last week, which was formed by the audience putting in the symptom that bothered them the most in perimenopause. And you could see the big highlights such as hot flushes or moodiness or difficulty sleeping and vaginal dryness. And these can go on for years. Incredible, really. Uh, I, I love that word cloud so much, which is why we Me wanted too. to show it to everyone today in case you missed last week. And the symptoms really were. And we will be talking about a lot of those symptoms and new symptoms with our special guest when we introduce her. But right now, we wanted to um, share something with you. Uh, one of our viewers wanted to share her experience with menopause and symptoms with all of us. Um, and I think that. That, uh, you'll be really amazed by her experience. Let's watch. My sleep was deeply affected. I, I just, I, I couldn't rest. I, I was exhausted all the time. Even when I did sleep, I was just worn out. Uh, the, the hot sweats, the, the hot flashes were intense. You know, it would be my burning up you know, my guy came to bed and he touched my skin and he was, oh my God, you know, you could, you could fry an egg on your thigh right now. And then the next moment I would be freezing, you know, just having to wrap myself up in blankets. I couldn't get to a comfortable temperature. You know, it was usually almost at bedtime when that was really going on. Um, my libido hit the crapper. 
I mean, it was really, that was never who I was. And now it was just sort of like, yeah, I could have sensuous pleasure with my loved one or I could have a sandwich. It was about the same amount of enthusiasm. And it was just, it, I did not feel like me. Poor Susan. Right, Dr. Absolutely. Margaret? She did such a great job of describing the key features that occur in menopause. And although everyone's different and has their own experience, I think Susan did such an amazing job of describing what was happening to her. And, and this is so common. I know I experienced a lot of what she did too. Okay, we have another poll question before we bring out our guest. But before we get to the next one, we do want to share with you the results of the first one. So let's see. Uh, wow, the vast majority, 92% are D, 45 to 65. That is exactly who we were hoping we would be speaking with uh, tonight because that is, um, you know, menopause and postmenopause. That is the, uh, the what, we're, what we're focusing on this evening. So we have another poll question for you. And again, if you're just joining us, didn't hear before, it's you take out your phone and you text to 22333. That's 22333. And then in the message box, you type in AARP, uh, hit send, and you'll get a response. And then you'll be set for the rest of the night with all the other poll questions. And again, your questions to us please do keep them coming in. I'm already getting quite a few. I'm very excited to get to them. Send them in the chat function um, on Zoom and on Facebook. Okay, so we do have another poll. Here's a question number two. Okay, have you sought medical help for your menopausal symptoms? A is yes and B is no. Have you sought medical help for your menopausal symptoms? Okay, that's poll number uh, two. And uh, while Dr. Margaret, while everyone is submitting their um, answers to that second poll, I have a question from a viewer who tuned in last week, didn't get her question answered during the show, so emailed us afterward. And I'd like to get to it, and here it is. Dr. Margaret, while everyone is answering that last poll question, oh, excuse me, <laughs> and everyone, oh, so, so sorry. My, here it is. My vagina is more dry now that I'm in menopause than when I was in perimenopause, and I'm really suffering. This is, I, I love this question. This is an excellent, excellent question because this is so common. Vaginal dryness is one of those symptoms that does not get better unless there's some kind of help because estrogen helps maintain the vagina's elasticity. It's what allows it to stretch. So when estrogen is no longer around in menopause because the ovary is no longer making estrogen, the acidity of the vagina in decreases. In other words, it becomes more basic. That increases the likelihood of infection. And also because estrogen's not around, the vagina can't stretch as well. It becomes pale, it becomes dry. And of course that can cause some symptoms like itching and burning and pain. Now, of course, there are some great treatments. There's some over-the-counter treatments that can be used, moisturizers, pH balancing uh, things like hyaluronic acid. And then also there are hormonal options. DHEA, vaginal estrogen. We can talk about all of these and, and actually we will talk about those next week. But the key thing here is vaginal dryness is something that can be helped. And I would absolutely encourage people that are having this to go seek help with their healthcare provider, their physician, you know, really ask about it. Absolutely. And we're also, I just want to remind everyone that next Wednesday, next week, we are going to be having Dr. Lori Mintz join us. Uh, Dr. Margaret will, of course, focus more on vaginal health, and Dr. Mintz will help us explore how to reinvent your sex life during and after menopause. And we'll be discussing all of this in a lot more detail. Okay, so fun. Let's look at the results of the second poll. Um, have you sought medical help for your menopause symptoms? So uh, the majority say no, uh, 
35% said yes, 65% said no. And this, again, Dr. Margaret, correct, is really very common. Uh, women don't seek help. And what's even worse is that when they do, often they don't get the help that they need. Okay, so um, go back to your phones, everyone, because we're going to do another word cloud, uh, another poll question, which is a word cloud now. So go to 22333. If you haven't done this already, then in the, in the text box, put an AARP and the rest will happen and you can respond. So here is our poll question, okay? What do you believe is the number one greatest health risk to postmenopausal women? What do you believe it is? Just one word would be great. And what's going to happen is we'll see all the words that everyone submits. Um, and uh, so while you're submitting your answers, let's bring out our special guests so we can continue the discussion and get as to as many questions as we can. Um, and also we'll talk together about all the words that we're seeing. Dr. Gloria Richard Davis, uh, you have an amazing uh, CV, which I'm going to have to read. I don't want to miss anything because it's so incredible. Dr. Gloria Richard, Richard Davis is the Executive Director, Division of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, and Professor, Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology, and Division Director, Reproductive Endocrinology and Infertility at the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences in Little Rock, Arkansas. She has served in leadership positions in medical professional societies, including the North American Menopause Society, NAMS, which we reference very frequently, and is a strong proponent of embracing telehealth, which we will be talking about, so all women can get better health care. Dr. Gloria, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you so much, Barbara, for having me. My pleasure. Thank you for coming on. Really excited to be with you. Thanks, Margaret. So let's Love right it. To word cloud. Let's take a look and see what the uh, some of the results are. I know they'll be kind of coming in. Wow. Okay, doctors. Let's take a look. Heart is the big one. I, I want to remind everyone too that on March thirty first, we're going to uh, have a cardiologist join us talk specifically about postmenopausal heart health, cancer, osteoporosis. Correct. Oh, correct. Correct. Depression, yeah, disease yeah. in general. Uh, heart really so far is the biggest one. Doctors, any comments here? Sir, I think heart and cancer, I think, uh, and, and osteoporosis. I mean, I really think we hit on the major risk factors and, and events. Absolutely. When you look at, at uh, heart disease is the number one killer in women. And we know that postmenopause uh, cardiovascular events increases. And one of the things that, that is beneficial in terms of hormone therapy is that it really translates into more favorable lipids. So perhaps less atherosclerosis in terms of development. Uh, Dr. Gloria, what, what about some of the other health concerns that our uh, viewers put up on the cloud wall? Really incredible. So many. Absolutely. So, so one of the things that I want to mention is that in a woman's body, almost every one of our organ system has estrogen receptors in it. And that estrogen is really important in terms of maintaining normal cell function and integrity. Which, you know, if you if you think about it in terms of translation to what happens to us postmenopausal, the loss of estrogen results in loss of bone. So the osteoporosis, you probably go through osteopenia first, then osteoporosis, loss of collagen of our skin. And as I mentioned in terms of heart disease, is that our lipid profiles oftentimes flip instead of having elevated good cholesterol like HDL we have less HDL and more LDL, the bad cholesterol. So th those are some of the key things that we see in terms of, of uh, long-term health issues with menopause. 
Mm -hmm. Dr. Gloria, I actually have so many questions from the audience. I'm thrilled about that. This one is to you, Dr. Gloria. Uh, it's uh, from Cynthia. How long does menopause last? I'm 65 and still having hot flashes and difficulty sleeping. I love that question. Uh, in fact, I just got off of a board meeting talking about some of these very issues. And, you know, when you think about the length of time for menopause, menopausal symptoms, the average woman experiences them for upwards of 7.4 years average. But we know that there are women who experience hot blushes, night sweats, in up to 20 plus years. So it's not that typical two years that sometimes people have been told that, you know, you, you can live through this. It's not quite that short-lived. Uh, Margaret, Dr. Margaret, is this the best time for women to establish their baseline health numbers? And if so, what tests should they get at this time? That, that's a, another really good question. I think that this is a great time to see your doctor. This is a great time to get a physical exam, to get your heart checked. It's a great time to get a pap smear. It's a, a pelvic exam, a breast exam, a mammogram. And then in terms of blood work, I would get thyroid studies. Many people also this is, can get their cholesterol done at the same time, which is really good to know where you're starting. And then if you do want to measure the numbers that are equated with menopause, you can get a follicle stimulating hormone, which is an FSH, and an estradiol level, which when you're in menopause, the follicle stimulating hormone is very high and the estradiol level is very low. I have what a question for you. Oh, oh, go ahead, Dr. Morgan. No, no, go no, 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 go ahead. Keep going. Just some women also get a bone density at this time to get an idea of where their bones are. Some wait until later on, but this is a great time to look at the risk factors that you have for bone loss and maybe get a bone density. And that's especially true if a woman is postmenopausal and she fell walking her dog and broke her arm, as I did. Um, exactly right. And that's when I did get my first bone density test. So I do encourage everyone to think about that as well. Thank you. Um, Dr. Margaret, I do have a question from uh, a viewer from last week also. Again, we wanted to get some in from last week as well as this week. Here it is. I was taking melatonin, but I still wake up in the middle of the night. I do go back to sleep eventually. I am trying a, a sleeping aid, but is there a widely used medication that you recommend? This is a great question as well, because this is so common. A lot of people don't realize that sleep is estrogen sensitive and estrogen helps people fall asleep. That is called the sleep latency, the time from when your head hits the pillow till you fall asleep. Medical students have a zero sleep latency. They're so tired that they just boom, fall asleep. But in menopause, this time increases. And without estrogen, it can really be a struggle. So having maintaining good sleep hygiene helps a lot. And antihistamine is often helpful. Melatonin, as you've tried, can be helpful. And then if appropriate and there aren't contraindications, estrogen might be warranted. This is something, again, I would recommend seeing your doctor, seeing a health care provider, and discussing the risks and benefits for the individual. Individualized treatment is what I always recommend. And this thing about sleep, I mean, sleep really is considered now the third pillar of overall good health. I don't think we really viewed sleep that way, you know, 10, 20 years ago, but we certainly do now. So it is very, very important. Thank you for that uh, question. Dr. Gloria, there's a question for you. Next one. A very important topic. I think we'll spend some time on this. One of the most common treatments for severe menopause symptoms is hormone therapy, HT. <clears throat> but HT continues to be controversial. Many women and even healthcare providers are not as eager to start hormone therapy as they were before a massive study came out in 2002 from the Women's Health Initiative, WHI. Big, big, big thing. 
which showed that there was an increase in the risk of cancer for women taking HT. However, as we now know, subsequent reanalysis of the data showed a different story. Can you explain this so we all understand it better? So let me just start by kind of summarizing what the WHI is or the Women's Health Initiative. We're almost 20 years out from the uh, WHI. And it was a large randomized clinical trial with an arm of patients who were randomized to estrogen and progesterone therapy, so E plus P, and one arm that was estrogen only, with the intent of looking at cardio, cardiovascular protection. Uh, but there was a preset safety threshold uh, for breast cancer. Now, we know from a lot of data that breast cancer risk does slightly increase with hormone therapy. So 1.29 is the number that we know. And so for this particular study, once the, uh, there was evidence that there was no reduction in cardiovascular events, but I'm gonna back up and say the average age of person in the study was 67. So that's a little bit late, right? There probably was some underlying cardiovascular disease then. So if you think about it in terms of, uh, of the two arms, they stopped the estrogen plus progesterone arm because they didn't see improvement and the breast cancer threshold was met. The estrogen only arm, however, they continued because they did not see that increase in estrogen, I'm sorry, increase in breast cancer in that particular arm. So in the reanalysis, some of the things that are, are very clear is it's not just estrogen, it was probably also the progestin component that was contributing to the increase in breast cancer risk. Thank you for that incredible explanation. It's a very complicated issue. Um, I mean, I know that many, many women were on HT prior to that study coming out, and doctors were very eager to recommend it to them. Um, it really was the gold standard. And then literally, as you all know, overnight, that changed completely. But I do believe more and more women are starting to understand the, you know, the risks and the benefits a little bit better now. But certainly it's not at all where it once was for sure. Um, Dr. Margaret, how do you know if you're a good candidate for HT? And if so, what is the best time to start estrogen therapy? What's the best time? Right. Well, you know, now we know, just as, as Dr. Gloria said from the WHI, we know that if you begin your hormone therapy early, close to menopause, within the first five to seven years, you actually are reducing your risk of cardiovascular disease. So if you start early, it's going to be the most helpful for your symptoms because that's when your symptoms are really the, the worst and it will be somewhat protective. Now, of course, we always have to consider the risks and the risks of hormone therapy. So anyone that's having irregular bleeding or has an increased propensity to blood clotting or someone with severe liver disease, someone that has an estrogen receptor positive cancer, those are people that we probably would not begin on hormone therapy. Otherwise, if you're having symptoms, it is something that you should discuss with your healthcare provider because it might be a good option for you. And as you know, we just heard, when the reanalysis took place and we saw that estrogen alone was not increasing breast cancer, in fact, possibly decreasing, it was the progesterone component. And remember the progesterone is for women that still have a uterus. We need something to balance the estrogen and the lining of the uterus. So now it's a really good thing to talk to your healthcare provider and figure out a balance that might work for you, you know, if it would. and starting early or starting at, at, at a time that's not far from menopause. If you are far from menopause, you know, 10 years or more, that really wouldn't be a time that I would start hormone therapy, but we could talk about a vaginal estrogen, just a local treatment that won't get absorbed, you know, significantly. That might be something that would benefit 
you if you're you know more than 10 years from your last period. Thank you for that, Dr. Margaret. And Dr. Gloria, I do have several questions from the audience now. I'm combining it into one question about women over 50 still getting periods or occasional periods. Is, is that a reason for concern? So when we, when we talk about the definition of menopause, it's a woman who has gone at least one year with no period. So if you've truly gone through menopause, you should not have further bleeding. But some women are still in that perimenopause, like you guys talked about last week, right? And so they will have intermittent bleeding. But it's, it's really important to differentiate between postmenopausal bleeding, because postmenopausal bleeding, the concern is estrogen, uh, unopposed estrogen, can cause precancerous changes in the endometrium and result in endometrial cancer. So you should seek care if that's happening and you're postmenopausal. Absolutely. So any postmenopausal bleeding, a woman should definitely seek medical care. Everyone, please pay attention to that. Um, Dr. Gloria, I do have another question for you. What if a woman doesn't want to or can't use estrogen? What are some of the other best options available including some off-label options that are meaning medications that were created for other health issues, uh, which have been used to uh, address menopause symptoms. What, what do you think? What are some options? So, you know, the first thing is really addressing what type of symptoms is the patient having. Uh, if it's systemic hot flushes, night sweats, then we do talk about uh, Options which are either oral, transdermal, right? So non-hormonal options, some of the categories that we utilize is, and it sounds really strange sometimes when I say this to patients, but um, antidepressants. Antidepressants were used in our breast cancer detection trial and was, was proven to decrease hot flushes. And then there's some antihypertensive meds, you know, so there are varying categories of medication that we can use. But if you don't have systemic symptoms, then, you know, just using a local treatment, which could be local estrogen, you don't have that systemic um, or increased level, blood level of estrogen. So if you're concerned about that, the local option is still good. And we have other non-estrogen options locally, like vaginal um, DHEA, prosterone, mm -hmm. and many other options. Dr. Margaret, would you like to add to this? Like, what are some of these discussions that you have with your own patients about other op op options other than estrogen options? Oh yeah, I mean exactly as as we just heard from Dr. Gloria, do the same thing. And for people who either don't want to take estrogen or estrogen is contraindicated, we'll talk about some over the counter products. Um, you know, I will I will describe some that are made from uh, a bee pollen. I might use one that um, has a is an extract of something that's taken from soy, but it's not soy. And sometimes these can be helpful for people who for instance, who have had breast cancer. So these are also agents. And down the line, where there are actually some newer studies looking at agents that block the receptors from follicle-stimulating hormone. And this might be something that really works for people. Um, so I think, I think we're, we're in an area now where there's a lot of research where it's known that we need more and more factors that allow people to handle the symptoms of menopause and you know appropriate for them. Great, um, Dr. Gloria, I have a question that came in again from someone who tuned in last week. I'd love to get to her question. Here it is. Is low dose estrogen a safe treatment for vaginal dryness for women who had estrogen positive breast cancer? Thank you. So great question. And I see a lot of these patients because in fact, I work with our medical oncologist and he refers a lot of his uh, breast cancer survivors to me. There, there is or has been a lot of controversy around what is acceptable 
use of vaginal estrogen. And as I mentioned earlier, the vaginal preparations that we have are very low dose. It doesn't really get into the blood system to, to an extent that we worry about it increasing the risk of, risk of breast cancer. So most of the medical oncologists are okay with, it, with women using that preparation. Um, the other option would be to consider things like vaginal DHEA, which is not estrogen, but it still improves the vaginal mucosa just like estrogen would. And then non-hormonal would be things like not vaginal lubricants, but vaginal moisturizers, which also helps to maintain the vaginal mucosa. You know, a lot of people I think are confused about the difference between lubricants and moisturizer. But again, everyone, we're going to be talking about that in great detail next week when we talk about vaginal health and uh, sex. Okay, so don't forget, put it in your calendars. Uh, Dr. Margaret, a lot of people want to know about bioidentical hormones. A lot of celebrities talk about them. And so a lot of women are thinking, oh, well, maybe I should consider it. Take us through this. What are they? Thank you. Well, bioidentical hormones are not FDA approved. They're not controlled, and there's no way that we can be 100% sure what is inside of them. Now, traditional pharmaceutically made hormone therapy is FDA approved, and it actually comes in so many different doses and delivery systems that usually we can work with a patient to meet their treatment goals by adjusting the dose of the medication or perhaps uh, changing the delivery system. If one by mouth isn't working, we could use a patch or a cream or a gel, or as Dr. Gloria is saying, we could use vaginal instead of systemic. So we can actually tailor the treatment to the individual by using FDA regulated safety controlled products. Dr. Gloria, thank you, Dr. Margaret. Dr. Gloria, let's shift gears a little bit. And by the way, I want to remind everyone to please keep sending your questions. I am looking down sometimes, again, not being rude or texting anyone. I'm reading your questions and uh, scrolling through the very many that are coming in. Keep them coming in in the chat function. Thank you. Dr. Gloria, um, we know that there are cultural and racial differences with how women experience menopause. I mean, look, we all experience menopause differently. That we've established. It's universal, but it's personal, I like to say. But talk us through this. What, what are some of those racial and cultural differences that women experience? So there was a study of women across the nation, of SWAN, that really helped us to understand and identify the difference in uh, race, different race and ethnicity, and how different women do experience menopause differently. And I think one of some of the key things that came out of that is that uh, black women actually experience more intense, frequent hot flushes than Caucasian, and for longer periods of time. Whereas our Asian women tend to have less symptoms. So it's important to note those differences. And I, and I make, that, um, make that distinction specifically because many of our Black patients believe that it's short-lived, it's going to go away, and they are just going to live through it. But they probably have worse symptoms than anyone else. And, uh, and so I don't want them to minimize their symptoms. It's really incredible. And what we're going to be talking about next, and my next question to you, I think really probably could help a lot of women to, to kind of equalize this whole playing field about menopause treatment and management, and that's telehealth. So let's move right into that. But everyone, first, um, I want to uh, ask another poll question and uh, a reminder of how to do that. You do go to your phone and text to 22. 333, type in AARP, press send, and you'll get a response and you'll be able to submit your answer to the poll. 
So here is our next poll question for all of you. Have you had a telehealth visit with a healthcare provider in the last 12 months? A is yes and B is no. Now we all know what's been going on the last 12 months and many of us have actually seen our doctors through telehealth uh, uh, system and uh, clearly it is booming. So uh, is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? Uh, what are the pros? What are the, you know, what are the cons? So we do want to talk with uh, Dr. Glory about that because this is a, a passion of hers and she's also a, quite the expert in it. So while, while you're all giving us your answers about whether you have seen a doctor uh, during the last 12 months via telehealth, Dr. Gloria, let's talk about it. Okay, so the current thinking is that telehealth helps increase healthcare value, affordability, because virtual care technology saves patients time and money, reduces patient transfers, emergency department and urgent care visits. This is important, I think, even for the, especially for the elderly. In addition, telehealth helps address physician burnout, which is an issue, by reducing clinicians drive times and allowing more time for patients. I took all of that from an article that I read and I thought this kind of sums it up. Please, we know it's been embraced during the pandemic. Right. Give us your right. views on telehealth and how you think it will, it will or won't help women get better health care. So all of the things that you said, is absolutely correct about telehealth. There, there are lots of benefits to it. And if we think about, we've been operating in this pandemic. Prior to the pandemic, telehealth existed, but we didn't see as many visits as we do now. It just really has exploded since the pandemic because one, it's safer to see your physician uh, via telehealth if you don't have to go in. Um, the other thing is that the reimbursement for telehealth because of COVID has been more broadly accepted. So that has helped also to fuel the use of it. And when you think about some of the, um, the care that we provide, a lot of it is, is conversations, is history taking. It's not necessarily having to do a physical exam. So there are lots of, of conditions or concerns that patients have that can be addressed via telehealth, even if it's, you know, even if you're outside of a typical broadband area, your phone, right? Your telephone, you got it. Almost everyone has a smart device nowadays, right? So it's easy to connect with your, with your provider that way. Um. I, for one, have embraced telehealth. I think it's remarkable. The only, I think, um, not downside, but the only challenge right now is that th there isn't uh, a way for a doctor to treat someone who's in a different state. It depends on the state, is what I'm saying. So I think there are still some crinkles that need to be worked out, but I think it's a, a true benefit and will help uh, everyone's uh, everyone to get better health care. I'm convinced. Okay, everyone. That's so very true. That's, but they're also looking at at expanding that. And and there are so states do. now. There are many states that you are allowed to uh, deliver telehealth care. Um, many states have actually expanded and changed the laws so that you can do this. And and one of the great things about telehealth now is that. You can see your regular doctor, your primary care physician, you can get a good physical exam. And then when it comes to menopause and the menopause questions, you can actually seek help from a menopause expert or someone that really specializes in menopause. So that dual ability, I think, is really great. And that can help you tailor the dose, the delivery. It can really help you 
manage your menopausal symptoms. So I think this is a, a great addition. I think it's here to stay. Some of my friends are doing a hybrid model where they're seeing their patients ahead of time via telehealth. They're doing the history. They're doing a discussion first. Mm -hmm. Then they're coming in for the physical exam. That way they can limit the face-to-face -face time that they have. So I, I think this is a great option for people. It is a great option, definitely I agree. And I agree with you, Dr. Margaret, that it is here to say. I'm sorry, Dr. Gloria, you wanted to add to that? I was going to say that's exactly right, Margaret, because one of the things that women do struggle with, sometimes it's finding a provider who specializes in menopausal care. And so this allows you to reach those experts. You don't have yes. to live in the same city. You know, you can get that uh, specialized care via telehealth. Absolutely. Right. And also, we did discuss this briefly last week with Dr. Lila Noctegal. And uh, one of the best places to go if you are looking for a menopause specialist is NAMS, the, the North American Menopause Society website. And they have a whole section on uh, menopause um, specialists. Okay, let's get the results of our last poll. Uh, did you or did you not have a telehealth? Um, let's see. Pretty, well, a little more it said yes. Up but pretty evenly split, 52%, 48%. Okay, so um, I, 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 we don't have time to ask all of you who said no, but I am very curious myself as to whether you said no because you don't want anything to do with it or just didn't happen. <laughs> so we'll I see. I thought there would be more, I have to say. I thought it was going to be about 80%. Yes. I agree with you. I'm a little surprised by these numbers too, but you know, I guess it just goes to show you that people are just holding off doing a lot of things, even telehealth. So, and, um, but you know what we, we saw in the beginning, um, that only a fraction of people were getting help for their menopausal right. symptoms. Right. And so this is emblematic of the issue, which is that even though there are problems and there are symptoms, people aren't reaching out and trying to get some assistance. So I guess the message is, you know, go see a doctor. Go see go a healthcare. See Thank you for tying those two together, Dr. Morgan. I really appreciate that because I was thinking the same thing is that, and I'm still stunned by that number, mm -hmm. how so few right. women are getting the, the, the medical help that they probably need. So I this, do. everyone listening, this is really a very good option, the way it was described to you, how the process can work out with telehealth for your own menopause management. So keep that in mind. Okay, everyone. So we have a lot of questions to ask all of, um, to, from all of you and keep them coming in. Remember the chat uh, function at the bottom on Facebook and on Zoom, keep them coming in. We're gonna try to get to some more, but first um, uh, ARP wants to share with you some e-newsletters that they've created that really speak to all women, all women like you. Take a look. The Girlfriend champions female friendship, especially as we age, and is a community of mostly Gen X women. We offer the best in health, sex, beauty, travel, career, and parenting information. The Girlfriend also offers an active online book club, as well as regular live events. Go to thegirlfriend.com. Sisters from AARP celebrates black women and welcomes all women. We cover a wide range of topics, including health and wellness, work and money, entertainment, live events, beauty, faith, and more. Go to sistersletter.com. And The Ethel from AARP. The Ethel is a community of women smashing stereotypes around aging and celebrating life at every age. The newsletter offers older women the best in health, sex, relationships, finance, and lifestyle information. The Ethel is named after Dr. Ethel Percy Andrus, AARP's founder who fought tirelessly for the rights of older Americans. Go to aarpethel.com. Subscribing is free and easy. Check them out now. Okay, everyone, we have a lot of questions to get to, and that's what we're going to do now. Um, this one is from Jody. Thank you, Jody. Do we know, it's a great question, do we know why some women suffer symptoms so much more than others? Why is that? Dr. Margaret, let's start with you. 
Well, I think it comes down to the fact that we know that, that just as Dr. Gloria said, there are estrogen receptors almost everywhere in the body. And different people have different receptors. And so when estrogen levels plummet and there's no estrogen around, some women, if they have a lot of receptors, might see that uh, and, and their bodies react by extreme symptoms, whereas others may have fewer symptoms, have fewer receptors. And so they might not respond in the same way. So I think there's a great level. There's also how gradual someone went in. Uh, a woman that goes into menopause really early but for the age of 40 is often going to have worse symptoms. A, a woman that goes into menopause because they've had their ovaries removed will have a, more symptoms and it'll be longer and, and stronger. And someone that has chemotherapy or radiation, the same thing is true. So it really depends on when, how, how gradual. Yeah. Dr. Glory, I have a question for you. Are there, this is great, are there things people can do to lift their estrogen levels naturally? You know, so I actually uh, lead our culinary medicine program. And certainly when we look at some of the foods that we eat, they do have estrogenic activity. For example, yams is one of them, right? Um, and then there are the natural uh, herbs and, and supplements that can have estrogenic activity. I, al I also make sure that I ask my patients about what they're consuming because there's estrogenic activity in things that we don't necessarily think about, right? So soy, for example, is, is, uh, has estrogen and anti-estrogen activity. So things like that, which you can consume. And, and does raise your estrogen levels. Thank you, Dr. Gloria. And I have another one for you. What about Hispanic women? Where do they fit into the spectrum when it comes to symptoms? So Hispanic women, like Black women, also tend to have um, more frequent, intense, hot flushes. Um, so, so they kind of go parallel, right? The, um, the, Caucasian women falls in the middle. Asians experience less Caucasian, and then you have Black and Hispanic women who experience menopausal symptoms the, great, the most. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you so very much. Uh, we are starting to run out of time. Uh, this was an incredible conversation. We're gonna continue this conversation every Wednesday night throughout March, Women's History Month at 7 p.m. Eastern time. Please put it in your calendars. And Margaret, Dr. Margaret, I know you have some takeaways from tonight that you'd like to share with everyone. I think we should summarize. You know, I think that yeah. we had a great conversation. And, and for me, I think the main points were, one, my favorite, which is individualized treatment. I think that menopausal symptoms occur when the ovaries are no longer producing estrogen. And the type and the timing of how you use estrogen treatment or any type of hormonal treatment is essential. And the bottom line is everyone is different. And so let's individualize our care. That's great advice, Dr. Margaret. And everyone, I would love for you to hear some advice from Susan, who was our viewer you met earlier on video. Let's watch. The advice I'd give other women is to be friends with women of different ages. Uh, first of all, older women have been on the journey before you. Uh, and have knowledge to give you and views of a larger life that you don't know about. Younger women need you as a friend and a mentor just the same way. I think, I don't want to get political, but I think one of the things that we've learned this year is if you stay in your own little bubble and your own little reality, you're only going to get mirrored back the same information. But if we expand, if we see a larger world, if we look at, if we befriend somebody and really listen to someone who's 20 years older or 20 years younger, oh my gosh, life just gets so much larger and much more positive. Dr. Gloria, that was really incredible, wasn't it? It's was great advice from a, a woman, a real woman on the street, as we like to say. Really great. Really, really great. And 
Dr. Glory, we can't thank you enough for joining us in this conversation, sharing your expertise, your knowledge, your thoughts on all of that we spoke about tonight, such important information, important topics. And really, as Dr. Margaret pointed out, the main thing is we want women to be open, to feel more open about menopause, talking with their healthcare providers, their partners, their families, their children, their coworkers, their bosses, everyone. And that's the point of this virtual series that AERP is presenting. So again, Dr. Gloria, thank you so very much. I echo all thank of that. You. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. We'll continue the conversation, everyone, next Wednesday night at 7 p.m. Eastern Time, when we're going to welcome Dr. Lori Mintz, best-selling author uh, and a uh, psychologist who focuses on sex and relationships. And we're going to cover a lot of ground. We're really going to zero in on reinventing your sex life uh, during menopause and after menopause. So, and again, every Wednesday night during March. Now, you can send us your questions ahead of time that please do, because it will help us to shape every episode that's coming up. You go to menopause at aarp.org. Send us your questions and we will get to them like we did tonight. And uh, you can get more menopause resources and watch all of the, the shows if you miss them by going to thegirlfriend.com. Okay. And and we really, really love to hear from you. We love to hear how you felt about this conversation and what you enjoyed or didn't enjoy. So please fill out the surveys. Let us know how you're feeling. And um, Barbara, it was so great to spend another night with you. I can't wait to um, see you next week, hopefully before, but this was really fun. It was really, really fun. Uh, and again, everyone knows what we're talking about next week. I do want to remind everyone that the week after, which is March 24th, we're going to have two incredible dermatologists joining us, both of whom you have seen on the, all the morning TV shows, the Today Show, Good Morning America and the like, and uh, talking about what happens to our skin as we go through menopause? What happens to our hair? These are really important issues. Um, you know, we, we want to feel good about ourselves. We want to look good. And uh, these two incredible doctors will talk us through a lot of the really most common issues. And then, of course, the last episode, March 31st, we're going to be talking about heart health, bone health, brain health with two incredible doctors. And of course, my co-host, Dr. Margaret. Dr. Margaret, always a pleasure. We will uh, can't wait to see you next week. And everyone, I can't wait to see you again next week too. Until then, remember this. We can't control getting older, but we can control how we do it. Good night, everyone.